All right, so we're just after one o'clock here on the East Coast. Uh, so welcome to everybody uh, to this webinar on sustainability after COVID-19. Uh, we're joined uh, with, by an all-star panel today who I'll introduce in a little bit. My name is Todd Court. Uh, I'm a lecturer here at the Yale School of Management uh, working on sustainability issues um, and really happy to uh, convene this discussion uh, along with the Yale School of Management on sustainability and, uh, and, and looking forward to how sustainability is going to uh, continue or be framed or evolve uh, following the COVID-19 crisis uh, in the next months or years to come. Um, there are some clear signs that corporate sustainability could play a larger role for businesses as we're seeking to emerge uh, from, this, from this pandemic. Um, just a few things that we've identified in the, uh, in, in the preparation are aspects like business resilience planning for corporations uh, could potentially evolve as uh, companies look more at these global, chronic, environmental and social issues that they're facing, such as climate change, um, and whether that sort of planning is going to change as we go forward. Uh, there's, there's indications of higher values now being placed on, on other capital, such as human capital and social capital uh, for businesses as they look towards the future. And of course, governments are now playing a larger role in the economy as, as trillions of dollars are being pumped into national economies. Um, and so the governments are now looking to see how they want to stimulate the economy going forward. So there's a lot of different factors uh, that might come into play for businesses going forward. Before we uh, uh, open up for questions and discussion, I want to introduce uh, each of our panelists and then give them a chance to give some introductory remarks. Uh, and then we'll go into the, the question and answer uh, for the majority of our webinar. Um, first off is Dr. Marion Chertow. Uh, Marion is a professor of industrial environmental management at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and director of the Center for Industrial Ecology. She is also appointed at the Yale School of Management and the National University of Singapore. Her research and teaching focus on industrial ecology, business environment issues, circular economy, waste management, and urban sustainability. Her research has championed the study of industrial symbiosis involving geographically based exchanges of materials, energy, water, and wastes within networks of businesses globally. She's carried out many studies of industrial ecology in China and India as a means of valuing environmental benefits alongside economic ones. In 2019, she received the highest recognition of the International Society of Industrial Ecology, its Society Prize for her, quote, outstanding contributions to the field. Prior to Yale, Professor Chertow spent 10 years in environmental business and state and local government, including service as president of a bonding authority that built $1 billion of waste infrastructure. She's a frequent international lecturer, serves as an advisor to the Center for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability at Train Technologies, uh, the Board of Directors of TerraCycle US, and the Board of Alliance for Research and Corporate Sustainability. Marion, welcome. Second, we have Professor Dan Esty. Dan is the Hill House Professor at Yale University with primary appointments in the Yale Environmental School, Environment School and the Law School and a secondary appointment at the Yale School of Management. He also serves as director of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy. Professor Esty is the author or editor of over 12 books, including the prize-winning guide to corporate sustainability, Green to Gold, and dozens of articles on environmental and energy policy and their connection to regulatory policy, corporate strategy, sustainability performance measurement, competitiveness, trade, and economic success. He edited the recent volume that emerged from the Yale Environmental Di Dialogue launched by Dean Indy Burke called A Better Planet, 40 Big Ideas for a Sustainable Future. From 1989 to 1993, Professor Esty served in a number of senior positions in the US Environmental Protection Agency. During this time, he led EPA's regulatory review process and helped to negotiate the 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change. From 2011 to 2014, he returned to government service as Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. In this role, he led efforts to draft Connecticut's first energy strategy, launch a green bank to promote clean energy, and restructure the state's regulatory programs. And finally, we have Professor Douglas Kaiser. 
Doug is the Deputy Dean and Joseph M. Field Professor of Law at the Yale Law School. His teaching and research areas include torts, animal law, environmental law, climate change, products liability, and risk regulation. He received his BA summa cum laude from Indiana University in 1995 and his JD magna cum laude from Harvard Law School in 1998. He has published articles on a wide array of environmental law and tort law topics and is co-author of two leading case books, The Torts Process 2017 and Products Liability Problems and Process in 2016. In addition to his many articles and chapters, Doug's monograph, Regulating from Nowhere, Environmental Law and the Search for Objectivity, in 2010, seeks to reinvigorate animal and environmental protection, and by offering novel theoretical insights on standing and inclusion, cost-benefit analysis, the precautionary principle, and sustainable development. So truly an all-star panel joining us today. Um, I want to give each of our panelists a chance to reflect a little bit on our topic for today around sustained corporate sustainability and policy and uh, uh, post COVID-19. So let's start with Marion. So Marion, do you want to give us some introductory thoughts? Marion, you're muted. It's rare that I'm muted. So this is great. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm especially pleased to be with Dan Esty and Doug Kaiser, who are uh, wonderful colleagues and great scholars. And um, I think you'll get your money's worth today. Where I want to start is that we're talking about sustainability. And um, Todd even asked us the probing question, what important factors and trends should we be following? So we know how the post-COVID economy is reacting to sustainability in, in a measurable way. But as per academics uh, all, everywhere, I do need to think about the definition of sustainability. I was preparing yesterday and I saw that one of my former students had written something about sustainability in the time of post, you know, post COVID. Um, what would it be like? And she was so upbeat. Um, she said that sustainability is physical and mental health and community support and enduring access to basic human needs like food and medicine and education. That's a direct quote. And I thought, gosh, uh, sustainability can't do all that by itself and sustainability needs lots of support. Um, and one of the issues about sustainability is that it can't be everything that we need. And she literally said, every uh, sustainability is everything we need in the face of COVID-19. So I'm not going to take that point of view, and I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, as I heard one of my Chinese students say the other day. Um, I'd rather be a Marion Muller over, but I, I'm known to many people for being pretty upbeat, and today I just want to give you the, the what's from my heart, you know, my sober heart about uh, sustainability uh, post-COVID. And I'm going to say that with the sustainability issue, I'd like to narrow it down a little bit from what my former students had to say. Uh, I'll go right back to the Brundtland Commission, which everyone knows sustainable development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet its own needs. Um, there are three legs of the stool or three pillars, economic, environmental, and social. And those have been abbreviated as people, planet, and profits. So that's uh, just kind of uh, lay laying out the, the boundaries a little bit. Now, interestingly, the people, planet, profits idea is part of what we think of as the triple bottom line. And many of us know that John Elkington uh, is the inventor of the triple bottom line. And so that's nice to have uh, economic, environmental, and social pillars. But guess what? Um, for 2019, John Elkington actually backed away from the triple bottom line. And he proposed, quote, a strategic, a strategic recall, a strategic recall of the concept. So here he is, the inventor of the triple bottom line, who's saying that we could have people, planet, and profit, saying, whoa, we better re revise this and rethink it. And why? Because they're not equal, those three pillars. Because, as John concluded, CEOs and CFOs and corporate leaders will move heaven and earth to make sure that their, their, their financial goals are in line 
um, their profit targets and so forth. But the same is very rarely true for the other planet targets, you know, planet and people. So um, his conclusion was that the triple bottom line has failed to bury the single bottom line paradigm of finance first. So that means a lot to me because I think that what people will be most concerned about post COVID is not sustainability, but economic security. And um, with respect to what factors and trends we ought to be tracking, I think we have to track foundational parts of American life. The first one being, can Americans trust their government? It's a leadership question. I actually think the leadership question in this case is more important than the sustainability question. And that many companies and um, communities will be guided more by the leadership that we will have than by um, the quest for sustainability. Um, so I myself think about environmental sustainability more than I do about social sustainability and um, economic sustainability. We are soon to rename our school the School of the Environment. And so I do lean in that direction. But leadership, what else is, do we need to track basic health and safety? This is absolutely crucial to know what, are our people sick or are they getting better? Uh, are there preventive measures? Remember EHS, environment, environment, health, and safety. The, all of us in corporate sustainability remember. And uh, health and safety is really important. Environment moved away from that, but uh, think about how much we've learned in that direction. And finally, I think we need to track a lot about education for our children. Uh, we know that it's not up to par right now. It's been a quick transition, but we need to we need to look at that. So as loyal as I am to my school and our mission as the School of the Environment, I really can't say that in environmental su sustainability, at least, is more important than these foundational things and that Americans will put their priorities on economic security. Now, there are times when um, environmental goals will uh, mesh well with economic security goals, and um, that will be uh, something very useful to keep in mind because uh, we can bolster economic security by having uh, less risk um, and climate change is a risk so companies will take up uh, will continue to take up climate change but more because uh, of the risk that it is to their economic security not necessarily for environmental reasons although that's usually stated as part of the package so um, this is what I wanted to say uh, first of all um, and uh, that where sustainability meets an economic security, I think there will be action. Um, and, uh, and I think we can probe that more as we have time in the, in the hour today. Yeah, thank you, Marion. I, I think there's already a lot of conversation starting in the chat around uh, where those two are going to be in, at odds with each other or complementary. So let me turn to, to Dan Esty um, for his introductory remarks, because he's, he's right at the center of that question. Todd, uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the Center for Business and the Environment at Yale and the organizing team that brought us all together today. I think the question of where sustainability goes post COVID-19 is uh, an important one. And I, I guess I wanna start by saying, I think we have to divide that future into a short, a middle and a long term. Uh, in the short term, I am of the belief that we're gonna stay focused on a public health crisis that's unlike any we've seen in a hundred years. Uh, and I think there is gonna be strong priority on uh, knocking back this virus really throwing everything we've got against it. I think in the middle term, and I hope that uh, middle term comes into sharp focus by this fall, but it may in fact not be until next year, there will be a, a very significant refocusing on the economic issues that have um, uh, come clear uh, in the wake of the virus, the downturn we've faced, the loss of jobs and security. And I think there's gonna be some fundamental rethinking required society-wide, but including in the corporate community about how all of us contribute to a society that's got uh, risk or attached to it. I think that's gonna involve rethinking the roles the companies play, rethinking how they employ people, how they provide healthcare, 
And I think there's kind of an intersection uh, that merges uh, starting with the public health crisis into economics. And then I think in phase three, what I'm going to call the longer term, uh, and I think that maybe uh, begins to kick in in a big way in 2021, we will really get to the sustainability questions front and center again. I think they are going to be a little bit on the back burner over the next uh, number of months through this short and middle term where public health and economic considerations are given the primary focus. But I do think see um, a change more broadly, a change that I think the corporate world was beginning to make and I think is going to pick up momentum uh, post-COVID-19 and then move beyond the crisis. And that I would describe, and this is a, not a novel description, but a shift away from a business model and a business purpose that might be called uh, shareholder primacy. Uh, the idea that companies are really uh, here for the purpose of delivering maximum profits to their owners. Uh, that's the old Milton Friedman, the world, which I think um, increasingly people recognize is, is not applicable, not appropriate for the 21st century. I think we are increasingly in a model for business that is more stakeholder uh, oriented, where there is a recognition that, of course, businesses still have to turn a profit. That's going to remain a, a big priority. But they also need to think about their responsibilities to their employees, uh, to their suppliers, to their customers, to the communities they operate in. And I think that new model, uh, which was already uh, growing, I think, over the recent years uh, and got some particular momentum in the last year as the Business Roundtable, for example, the leading uh, gatherer of corporate CEOs in the United States, restated its view of a corporate purpose, really shifting away from that shareholder privacy to a stakeholder responsibility model. And I think we've seen in particular in the investor world, a growing emphasis on belief that companies that are focused on that shareholder, uh, on the stakeholder model are likely to do better than ones narrowly focused on shareholders out over time. And you've got people like Larry Fink of BlackRock highlighting the importance of this shift in where BlackRock is gonna put its money betting in the longer term payoff to those that have this broader gauge view and are taking society's interests uh, more into account. I also think we learned some lessons in the COVID-19 moment that I think are gonna continue to shape corporate sustainability going forward. One is that um, data and science uh, and analytic rigor matter. And while we've had a, a debate about that in the political arena, I see the corporate world as solidly coming down on the side of needing the analytic frameworks uh, and wanting to uh, be guided by good science, by good data. So I think companies are gonna double down on the value of data and analytics uh, guiding their own path forward. I think we've also seen that companies want and benefit from public policy that helps define the foundation for their market engagement, for the competition that they are participating in and they want expert guidance on this. We've seen, I think, the value of, of experts. Uh, I've been saying for some time, we need a Dr. Fauci for sustainability, a Dr. Fauci for climate change. And um, I think trusted experts make a difference and companies want that. Uh, they don't wanna be guessing, they want guidance. Uh, and I also think we're, we're understanding, Marian mentioned this already, that leadership matters. Uh, corporate leadership matters, companies that are standing up and really uh, taking these issues seriously and trying to do the right thing on a longer term basis, I think are going to come out of this crisis looking better. They're going to be seen as the kind of companies that people will want to invest in uh, and frankly work in and be part of and have in their communities. And there are some other companies that I think have um, mishandled this, have seen it uh, in a short term profit minded way. Uh, and I think those uh, companies will suffer. So I think the companies that really stepped up and stood up and uh, hired people rather than let go uh, profit and some others that have uh, been kind of fighting where either their employees or their customers, and I would point out Air as an example, it was not gonna give refunds to people who had to pull back their uh, house rentals and apartment rentals. I think they're gonna be badly wounded. Uh, and obviously there's some other industries that are gonna suffer from fundamental changes that are coming out the other side of the virus in how we are gonna do business in America. I think we've now learned that we can do much more online, uh, shopping online, communicating online, business meetings online. And I do not expect the airlines to come back uh, in that regard for a very long time, if ever. Um, I think the world is now 
thinking about ways that we can do things without having all the flying around that used to be part of business life. And I think there are other elements uh, of corporate team plans, of sort of corporate practice that are likely to change. Uh, I, one last thing I'll mention, I think we've also seen the importance of understanding when competition is effective and when cooperation is effective. And I've long argued that corporate strategy has to be a combination of those two things. Um, and uh, this is work that's been done at Yale over many years. Our colleague Barry Nailbuff has written about coopetition, uh, that there's an optimal mix in the business world of competition and collaboration. I think that reality has come back into sharp focus. And we now understand that particularly things that are public goods, like a vaccine to a, the coronavirus, uh, we want to have an optimal combination of those two things, but a particular remembering that uh, collaboration is often critical uh, across companies, across industries, across countries. And I think um, you know, we have been, I believe, uh, quite seriously disserved by the failure to understand those important principles, uh, at least in the political leadership in the United States. So let me pause there and uh, happy to pick all of this up as we turn to questions and answers. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Um, a, a lot of important uh, issues raised there, and I think that uh, they're triggering more questions than we're going to be able to answer even in our hour. So um, we'll pick those up as we go along. But let me go next to Doug uh, uh, to get your thoughts on the table as well, and then we'll shift to questions. Great. And I'll try to be brief so that we can maximize our time for that interaction. Um, I want to thank the organizers, but also thank the 350 participants who I see have joined us today from all around the world. I appreciate your engagement with these issues, particularly at this critical time. The background I chose for today is a BB News, BBC News graphic, which shows the history of carbon emissions over the 20th and 21st century. And the story it tells is, is, is pretty clear, but also pretty concerning, uh, that the only time it seems that the world is able to successfully lower its uh, carbon dioxide emissions is when we are in the midst of massive dislocation and suffering, whether it's economic events like the Great Depression or the financial crash of, uh, of 07, 08, uh, or it's other disruptive events like wars and pandemics. Experts are estimating that 2020 will see a drop in global CO2 emissions between 6 and 8%. And that's that red dot on the chart behind me. Now, misery and suffering are not good climate change policy. And yet, that seems to be the only way the global community has successfully reduced its carbon footprint in the past. There's an argument emerging among conservative critics of climate policy that the current situation, the COVID lockdown, the economic dislocation, the, the, the loss of, um, of freedoms of movement and exchange that we've all become accustomed to, the argument is that's a preview of what climate change laws would do to our societies if we adopted things like the Green New Deal. Um, it's a misleading argument, but there's, actually an important kernel of truth in it, which is that policies to promote sustainability, environmental sustainability, have to simultaneously promote economic opportunity and indeed promote shareholder value maximization. So those things have to be brought into harmony somehow. And we have to um, definitely think beyond the notion that misery and suffering are the only ways we know how to, how to avert climate catastrophe. Now, the other thing that's notable about this chart that I want to highlight is that the estimated 6 to 8% drop is just that. It's only 6 to 8%. Now, there's a couple of different ways to look at that. The positive spin would be, yes, 6 to 8% per year in greenhouse gas reductions is the kind of scale of reduction that we need to shift the world economy onto in order to glide towards a net zero carbon emissions economy by mid-century and avert some of those most dire uh, climate projections. So that's the positive spin. We've shown that the world community is capable of that kind of sharp, sharp decline. But the reality check is, well, how, how, were, how is this six to 8% achieved? Well, it's achieved through massive, massive shifts in individual behavior. 
um, individuals who are not flying, who are not driving, who are eating at home, who are eating less meat. Um, it's, it's, it's the quarantining and lockdown of billions of people around the globe and also the decline of economic activity associated with that. So you can't repeat that every year for the next 50 years. That was a sort of one-time um, radical alteration of individual behaviors and consumption patterns and decision-making. Um, and it's one that, that individuals only appear to be able to abide for, for a, a set period of time and not make a permanent shift. Um, and even if they could, it would just be a one-time shift, not an annual reduction. So what that suggests is that in the post-COVID world, if we're going to resume uh, a, a concerted focus on avoided climate catastrophe, we're going to have to really be looking at structural changes. We're going to be have to, to look at the infrastructure right now that's still in place, that's still contributing 98, 92 to 94 percent of the emissions that we contributed in 2019. That has to be the focus going forward. Um, and that brings me to my last point. The first question posted in the Q&A box was from Jasmine Lowe in Singapore who asked, you know, what about, what about firms and entities that aren't able to afford green technology and afford the kind of higher cost practices that are associated with being an environmentally and sustainable uh, enterprise? I guess the point I would make there is that there is no such thing as a free market. Every market is deeply and radically distorted by government policies. And most governments around the world currently distort in the direction of very environmentally destructive practices like fossil fuel um, companies and industrial animal agriculture and uh, chemical manufacturers and other very, very intensive practices. And they're subsidized to the tune of billions, if not trillions of dollars around the globe. So post-COVID, as governments are thinking about how to effectuate their heavy, heavy hand in economic practices, which is going to get heavier with all the trillions of dollars of bailouts that are going to be necessary around the globe, with all the infrastructure rebuilding that's going to be necessary, the governments need to be thinking about the path they want to take on that heavy hand? Is it going to be doubling down on outdated, unsustainable practices, or is it going to be shifting to new and hopefully less burdensome practices on the planet? Uh, you know, it's going to be a million different little decisions. Those cities that have shut down roads to vehicle traffic and given them over to bikes and pedestrians, are they going to keep those roads that way? Or are they going to yield to the demand of their commuters to open up the roads because nobody wants to be packed into mass transit when there's a pandemic afoot. Those kinds of decisions are going to be everywhere around us and there'll be a sustainable path and there'll be an unsustainable one and it's going to take courage and commitment to stick to the sustainable path. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all three of you. There's, um, there's an enormous number of questions already on the board and I'm going to try to start paraphrasing uh, bunches of them together. But let me start with this uh, first really tangible question. Um, so one of the uh, several of the articles that I've been reading have been talking about uh, how relevant the COVID pandemic has been to other sustainability issues like say climate change. It's a global risk that businesses have to deal with that it's very difficult to diversify your way out of that risk. Um, and what the pandemic has shown us is that the business resilience planning for companies has more or less been, uh, has, has fallen short. I mean, we, you know, we we're suffering enormous economic damage right now. So when we look at other risks like climate change or water shortages or, you know, widespread inequality, all of these are business risks. How do you think that companies can start to adjust the way they uh, conduct their business resilience planning um, in, in light of these sustainability risks? Are we learning anything from the COVID pandemic in our, in our resilience planning? Well, I can start that conversation and let others jump in. Um, I think we're seeing, number one, is that companies that have given some thought 
to resilience uh, and have um, you know, weathered the last uh, several months better than others uh, turn out to be the ones that are also better at sustainability. So one of the data conclusions that we're starting to see is that if you look at the environmental social governance metrics, the ESG metrics that kind of gauge uh, sustainability leadership, those that are at the high end of that scale have had less in the way of stock market uh, dip as a result of COVID-19. So I think what we're seeing is that um, there is a payoff to resilience, a payoff to sustainability, um, not perhaps cause and effect so much as who are good at the sustainability issues and kind of overarching challenge they represent in society may also be good at or better than the competition at thinking about resilience, understanding the kinds of uh, unexpected challenges can arise that, arise that companies need to be part of. And I guess I would, I would say it, it also strikes me that we are seeing here um, the need for more creativity in business thinking and business model development. Um, and I do think that that is a part of the process going forward. And I think we're going to see a big push to, uh, and, and Doug was effectively saying this, so I'm gonna give my own spin on what he was uh, pushing us to think about, but it looks like the world is gonna be different going forward. And one of the questions is uh, what changes and how do companies either keep up with it or better yet lead it. And I do think uh, the key for governments is gonna to be to put in front of our business community the incentives to be solutions providers. Uh, we're already seeing that with regard to COVID-19, but I would like to see sharpened incentives in front of the business community for innovation on climate change. And I do think that's how we overcome um, the core of the challenge Doug was presenting, which is that we do know how to reduce emissions, but we haven't done it without huge economic cost. So the innovation challenge that I think we need to present to the business community is how do we reduce emissions dramatically? headed for deep decarbonization over the next couple of decades, but in a manner that improves and doesn't diminish economic circumstances, that protects and doesn't expose workers, and ensures that we can continue to have a vibrant economy. And I do think uh, innovation, as well as some degree of behavioral change, uh, are required to deliver on, to deliver on promise. Marion or Doug, do you want to add anything? I would just um, I would just add that I think one silver lining of the COVID crisis is that we're having these vivid illustrations of what a failure to attend to resilience does and what it looks like. I think for a long time, there's almost been a failure of intellectual capital in understanding truly what resilience is and how one would go about maximizing sustainability and resilience as opposed to maximizing efficiency and optimality. But now we have these examples where, particularly in the U.S., you know, the, the, the notion that um, the healthcare system only needs to have the amount of ventilators that's necessary to distribute them just in time to meet your expected peak of demand, ignoring fat tail risks like, like pandemics, you know, we, we vividly now understand what that failure looks like. The, the idea that a couple of, of massively sized vertically integrated meatpacking facilities could go down with a virus outbreak, and that would cause major disruptions to the entire food system of the continent. Like that's a vivid illustration of the dangers of vertical integration and consolidation, whatever it might have meant in terms of shareholder maximization and economies of scale. All that was ignoring the fat tail risks, which are very much a part of our, our lived experience now. Yeah, there's been some discussion about um, supply chains in particular, whether, you know, the, the drive for efficiency, which tends towards kind of long and deep, um, uh, but very uh, narrow supply chains is the most effective solution going forward, or, met, or whether investors will start to look more for resilience in supply chains, which would be broader and, and, and less deep. Um, Mary, do you want to add? Yeah, I wanted to add to the to the past discussion. I, I think that, um, as everyone has said, many of the cracks in our system have been deeply exposed. And we know on many levels, uh, from food systems, to the supply chains, the healthcare, everything uh, in, the, in, in that line, um, look to be pretty broken. And I really feel that this will generate market opportunities for companies. And um, 
I think those will be the ones that are, are picked up first in, in small part because of sustainability and environmental issues and in larger part because as the world moves on, you know, progressive companies try to stay with it and new companies try to, uh, try, to try, try to get in in areas that have is yet been uncovered. So um, this goes back to my earlier theme about uh, economic security, not only at the individual level, but also at the family level, also at the company level, also at the city level. Look at all the worries uh, we have now about cities needing to go bankrupt and even states needing to go bankrupt. Um, so uh, let's, not, let's not dislike someone because they're seeing a market opportunity. Um, I work with a company called Train Technologies Inc. And um, they used to be called Ingersoll Rand. They broke off from Ingersoll Rand because they saw such a great opportunity to use their climate control technologies to get an advantage in the marketplace from safer refrigerants and that sort of thing that they've been able to generate and to uh, offer some cooling in a warming world. Those are market opportunities and um, they will continue to be followed. I, I do feel that that last fall last year, I remember challenging my fall class to say, it really does feel like companies are moving on climate change now. They understand not only that um, it's a big public risk, but there are a lot of private elements to that public risk within the companies that don't make the change that will be left behind that, um, that if they're not paying attention. And so that's beyond just, you know, doing things for, for economic opportunities. It's, it was really a sense that uh, it, was, it was coming together. And then I think this has been a big setback. So I, I've seen just in my career in, as an environmental watcher, you know, we get optimistic and things start to be better and then they go down and then they go up and then they go down. And I think we're in a down and we'll figure out how to go back up, but it will just take lots and lots of effort. So uh, I want to come back to uh, there's two aspects of leadership that I want to touch on, and I think they cover a lot of the questions in the in the Q and A here. One is around government leadership, and the other is around corporate leadership, and the two are going to be related. But let me start with government. As as we look forward to kind of what a uh, a a responsible recovery could be, right? As governments are trying to incentivize businesses to go in certain directions in the recovery. Um, can you reflect or th uh, on what you think would be the, the appropriate role and direction of government? And I'll, and I'll give some, some straw men for this. There was a, a Friedman article in the New York Times a couple weeks ago where he advocated for market incentives to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, he advocated for um, more widespread internet access uh, to address equality, inequality issues uh, as we move more and more online. We've had comments in the Q&A around um, whether protectionism, national protectionism is going to be either you know, good for uh, uh, citizens of nations or bad for governments going forward. Uh, there is a comment around whether governments could prioritize social justice as a way to do this intelligent recovery. Can you reflect on what you think is the appropriate role and maybe even mechanisms that government should be looking at going forward, either in the US or, or internationally? Well, I'll jump in. I, I, I think that um, at least in the US, what we need is a real social safety net and a responsible recovery must include a real social safety net uh, to deal with the increasing equality. I mean, in many ways, uh, COVID has hit at our differences, you know, um, people of color, older Americans, um, people with conditions and so forth. And, and that divides us even more. And so we really need to, we need to, to, to somehow address that gap. Um, and uh, I, I, I would start in my thinking about uh, responsible recovery with, uh, revisions to the healthcare and hospitalization systems, um, and also housing. I mean, housing is a source of inequity um, that if it can be addressed, just solves lots of other problems um, for families. And so that's a throwing out something to start with. Dan or Doug? Dan, go ahead. Um, I think that there are growing elements of uh, leadership 
in some countries political and other places business that are starting to say that we do need to rethink the business model going forward. Um, Prince Charles in Britain has uh, launched a Build Back Better initiative. Uh, Alan Jope, who's the CEO of Unilever uh, and fills very big shoes with uh, having taken over for Paul Pullman, one of the great sustainability leaders in the corporate world. Uh, Alan Jope is saying that we need a new capitalism. Uh, we need to rethink uh, basically the, uh, the structure of the social contract between business and society. And I think there is a moment for that coming. And in my mind, the, uh, the starting point is to think about what it takes to create markets that support sustainability. And my view is that there is a, uh, a lot that has to be done in that regard, but a core principle that we might wanna start with. And that is that we should really bring to an end externalities that have damaged our approach to sustainability. Uh, that's, of course, using the language of economists, uh, the idea of ending externalities. And of course, we're not going to end externalities. There still will be pollution. But what I mean is that there should be no spillovers of harm from private businesses onto society that are not paid for. Uh, and this is kind of harms should be called out, uh, should be measured, uh, and companies should be asked to either stop them or pay for them. I do think this idea of a uh, no harm or free on society is gonna challenge some companies. Uh, some companies have business models that only survive because they're externalizing costs from their own private account onto society's account. And I think that would be a, a very good starting point for uh, this remaking of the foundations for business uh, as we go forward. I'll just uh, add a little bit to something Marion had, had mentioned. You know, the, the thought of economic justice and reducing inequality as being something that's not siloed off in this corner and unrelated to sustainability. I think that's a really critical point. You know, I've often um, wondered whether we could start looking at reducing wealth inequality as itself the most cost effective way to lower greenhouse gas emissions. Because if you look at the greenhouse gas intensity of individuals, it's so tightly correlated with wealth and skewed at the top end that if we just took some of the money away from that elite 1% and redistributed it to the global 99%, it would actually be a sustainability policy, uh, not just an economic justice policy. And one hopes that these governments like South Korea and Europe who are sticking to the idea of a Green New Deal and making it part of their post-COVID recovery vision, one hopes that they can stick to it long enough so that it becomes a kind of proof of concept. It becomes something that's visualizable and, and, and therefore seen as realizable in other countries around the world. Um, so let me flip this, this question to the corporate side, asking about corporate leadership. And again, we have a number of questions on this in, in the Q&A, but I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase this way. If you were to give advice to a CEO of a company today to say, you know, in the short and the medium and long term, as Dan presented it initially, we, you have to, you know, it's crisis management uh, in the short term. It's, uh, and in the long term, it's about, you know, the integrating sustainability more fully to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there. If you were to give advice to that CEO, um, what would you tell them uh, if, you want, if they wanted to become an effective leader um, going forward? What are the, the key bits of advice that you would point to for that CEO? So I'll give two quick thoughts and then uh, let Doug and Marion pick this up. You know, I think point number one is I would look at my business model and ask whether it depends on unsustainable practices. Does it depend on externalizing costs onto society? And if so, I would begin immediately to re-gear uh, ahead of being told to do it by governments uh, and by regulation or being put out of business because there are new uh, charges for uh, emissions. Uh, and I, by the way, think that the externalities that I'm talking about are not just environmental. Uh, they also could include some of the things that Marion and Doug have been talking about in terms of the uh, sort of uh, elements of inequality that find their way into the corporate world. So I think um, that's point number one. The second point I would argue is that we've learned, uh, I think, a very big lesson in the last few months, and that is that we need to have a broader gauge vision uh, at the top of the corporate world. And I would argue that any one person can't do it. 
that's why we should have boards of directors for companies that have much greater diversity, uh, diversity of perspectives, diversity of backgrounds, so that we can bring into focus some of the issues that we're talking about today that were not front and center for many companies. And I think has led to some blind spots that uh, produced less good results, less resiliency on the part of some companies. Marion, did you want to add to that? Yes, and, and it takes me back to uh, uh, something that Doug said, which is that um, when you talk, when you looked at more conservative business people, they said the policies also have to promote things like shareholder value and so forth. Um, and I, I think that um, in America, companies will ultimately be the ones who, who get us out of the worst uh, of this. Um, for lar in large measure, because that's how we, we, we often do things um, with the support of government, of course, but um, American ingenuity is something that I s still believe in. And I think that uh, what we need to do is to en enable the conversations so that something, so it, it, it doesn't look like someone's doing something for selfish reasons. You know, uh, on the other hand, um, even the most, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, people that are most on the left can't think that someone's only doing something for profit reasons and that we all have to be able to uh, understand this issue much more. Um, I just want to uh, say that years ago, Dan, uh, Dan Esty, my, my colleague Dan Esty and I uh, worked on a book together about the future of environmental policy. And we had a word that we used to use back and forth all the time, which was, called, we used to say, it's a twofer. You know, in other words, if cars can go off the highway, you know, if we can get more cars off the highway, then people will have shorter commutes. And so they might do the environmental thing because it's all tied up also in the fact that they want to get home earlier and see their family. And um, this kind of twofer thing is something that we, we, we maybe should elevate Dan <laughs> from what we did 20 years ago. And, uh, and, and look at it the same way, you know, um, uh, I looked at a company that was taking the gigaton challenge. They were literally going to take a gigaton from their customer supply chain. This was mentioned, Dan, at the event you did with, on Earth Day with Jeff. And um, imagine that, making that your goal to take all that, those emissions out of your, your, your customers. Um, so there's a lot of lines to cross but there's also a lot of understanding to have. Todd, I'm gonna to say something um, that might feel a little bit out of left field, but when I contemplated your question, I, was, I wanted to reframe it as, you know, not what are the qualities of leadership that must prevail post COVID, but who should be the leaders post COVID? Mm -hmm. And I've really been struck by the fact that um, a common characteristic of many of the countries who are coping with this crisis with most social key cohesion and most success have women heads of state. Um, and part of me thinks maybe what needs to happen post COVID is that we need to step aside a bit and make room for a much more diverse set of, of leaders. Yeah, I, we've, I think we've all seen those statistics about the, the top eight responses have all been women-led. Um, Although, in, interestingly, a lot, a, another factor, I mean, I've been pretty impressed by what uh, less democratic company, countries than ours have been able to achieve as well. And, and I, I thought a lot about that. And, and again, something that you said, Doug, you know, that the, with the chart uh, sitting behind you, um, that CO2 only goes down in these, with, these, with a lot of misery um, and I want to actually sh share something else. Uh, this was, happened to me in China. I, I was in China. Uh, I was in Beijing in the fall of 2008, which was right after the Olympics in Beijing. And it was hard to miss that the skies were blue and the air was clear and you could see the mountains that you can never see that ring Beijing. And my colleagues, my Chinese colleagues explained to me, well, you know, there's a growing middle class in China. And that middle class is starting to value uh, clean air and starting to value the ability uh, to, you know, to have ensure that their children can breathe and so forth. And this has happened, of course, in, in um, other countries as well in Eastern Europe. 
But, but what I wanted to take away from that is that people were willing to alter their behaviors um, in, 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 the, in the hope of getting a blue sky. And now we're seeing those amazing pictures on television where there's you know, animals roaming in cities and um, all kinds of environmental uh, 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 good things happening to the six to eight drop in CO2, wish it were more, but you know. Um, and and I, I think that I want to take heart uh, from the idea that, that the human desire for, for cleanliness and the environment and so forth is also something that we've seen in practice that can leverage and, and, and create behavioral change. Let me let me shift gears a little bit from the what should happen to the what will happen um, or what we think will happen. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll make this question a little specific. Several of the questions in the in the sidebar here are around um, which aspects of corporate sustainability are going to grow uh, post COVID and which are going to go away. So there's been discussion around pl single use plastics in the age of kind of higher hygiene. There's been questions around uh, air pollution and whether people like it enough that they're going to change their behavior. And then maybe a, a really underlying question worth talking about is the future of the fossil fuel industry, um, given the double whammy of COVID and the, and the uh, price war that uh, was partially resolved. Um, so if you had to put on your, your crystal ball hat, um, and, and predict which aspects of sustainability you think will will create success for companies over the next several years. What what would you point to? All right, Doug, Doug you, you want... look like you're ready to go. <laughs> yeah, Doug, you, you you got the the biggest thinking face on. <laughs> It is just so uncharacteristic of me to um, to even have the temerity to want to answer a question like that, Todd. It, I, all of my scholarship is focused around the need for humility and the limits of human <laughs> cognizability and how the future has nasty surprises. And um, but I mean, I I think Dan mentioned a few of the of the 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 radical shifts that we're seeing right now that might actually be durable shifts. Um, and I, I, I think I'm in agreement with the ones that he mentioned. I do think the workplace is going to change as a result of this. A lot of us have decided we really don't want to wear hard pants anymore. We want to stay um, working from home, at least for some portion of our, our professional lives. And, and the amount of travel that we had undertaken previously, um, much of it seems a bit kind of superfluous and, and quite harmful now in, in retrospect. And I do think there will be those cultural changes that have significant economic consequences. Um, but in terms of like environmental issues and, you know, is this really the death of mass transit? Is this the death of subways and commuter rail? Is this the revival of single use plastic? That's really gonna depend on the decisions of millions and millions of individuals acting largely in an uncoordinated fashion through their daily market decisions. And um, I want the governments to put as much of their heavy hand as they can in support of the sustainable practices. But at the end of the day, in market economies, that's very hard to predict. It's a well-hedged answer. Appreciate so that. Just, um, <laughs> pick up from there and say, you know, I think Doug's got it right, which is that the public is going to want multiple things at once. Sustainability may be a bigger part of what they want, but it's not the only part. They're going to want, um, you know, public health standards. They're going to want to feel safe, uh, not only at work, but out in the, in the community. And I do think that raises questions. Um, and I think it drives us to two fundamental levers of change. One is um, what people are willing to do um, behaviorally. What is it that people are going to do in terms of how they change their lives and some amount of the pathway to a sustainable future to deep decarbonization in particular will come from, I believe, behavioral change. But I think some of it's got to come from innovation. Um, you know, my guess is that people are going to want um, secure uh, food handling uh, packaging. And, uh, you know, plastic has some advantages in that regard, but it need not be the only way that you do that. And I think there's going to be a big push for perhaps more fiber-based packaging, 
that has, if not uh, full recyclability, more so than plastic, and, uh, and compostability beyond that. So it is a better sustainable product. So I think there are um, real values that can be advanced here with the kind of uh, a well-crafted set of policies that both promote optimal behavioral change, but also incentivize innovation to get us around some of these tough trade-offs. People want both low cost and environmental protection. And uh, right now the options seem to be uh, making that a choice rather than a combined goal. Marion, do you have a projection? Well, um, uh, what will what will change? What will stay? I I've been surprised actually at how quickly we've jettisoned uh, so many environmental things already in this uh, just a couple months, you know. And and uh, we close the national parks. Um, we don't have the right planning. Uh, we're Reuse is going out the window at the grocery store and everywhere else. Uh, curbside programs are being canceled. Um, you know, it, it's fascinating to me uh, that uh, we let them go uh, so fast. And even in light of the fact that many people are showing a passion for nature, I've been reading about that on the uh, question and answer. Um, so these are. Um, this is just more evidence to me that uh, we're going to have to build up very carefully and very, very thoughtfully along the lines that, that Doug and Dan have been talking about um, because there are so many needs um, and uh, we might, we environmental people might just be in there just arguing for our points and trying not to lose space rather than gaining space. And, and I'm, I'm concerned about that um, as everyone is so motivated to meet their own goals. So we're just about out of time, and I want to I want to end on a, a, a hopefully an optimistic note. There's there's been a, a fair amount of of conversation or questions about this. There's two effects going on here. There's there's one effect about how how it raises the importance of sustainability in our awareness, but the other is that we are likely uh, you know are definitely headed into a recession and or depression. Um, which means less spending power uh, across the board, um, and it, it, on first blush, these are uh, these are counter uh, factuals. Right? This, if I have less to spend, then I cannot spend, you know, more money to make more sustainable products to make more sustainable decisions. Um, I can't pay higher rent, for example, in my real estate uh, to to get a green building, for example. So. I, I, I'm, I presume that across the panel, you would, um, you would point out that there are some aspects of sustainability that do not uh, necessarily cost money in the short term. But it, I wonder if we can end the webinar on a positive note to say that you know we're not looking at a recession of sustainability as well as uh, of the economy. Um, and if you have, uh, if you have kind of examples that you would point to where you think that we can grow both at the same time in the shorter term rather than the longer term. Just a quick thought on that. I do think leadership matters. So I would close on the thought that it's leadership that often gets you out from the trade-offs. Uh, leadership in uh, a structuring uh, the way companies are going to operate, but leadership even more so perhaps in how policy gets framed. And I think that's what's going to be key. I'll close. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Marion. Well, on the business side, I, I just was going to say that, uh, you know, Dan edited this book on big ideas for this 21st century. And um, uh, I was pleased to be an author and I wrote about materials and so forth. And, oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go buy a few copies. Um, and uh, uh, what I predicted in there that in my area of interest, which is more along the lines of uh, energy, uh, waste, physical things, um, that entrepreneurship would save us, that uh, our young people would really get out there and say, I want to do something different. I don't want to, I, I want to be able to sit home in, in my soft pants um, and not have to commute so that I can do something more exciting and good online. Um, I, I feel that that optimism still, but um, in order to be a good entrepreneur, we also do need a good economy and we do need good education and we do need good health care and that takes leadership as Dan has said. So that's me. 
Doug, last words? I'll just close on a corny anecdote, but I think it might have some resonance, I hope. Um, so uh, at, early in, in the shutdown, I went to visit a very good friend of my family's, uh, a restaurateur and chef who runs the best Thai restaurant in New Haven. And he had shut down the whole restaurant and uh, was um, but still cooking away. And I kind of shouted at him from the sidewalk to see how he was doing. And he explained that um, because there's no Buddhist temple for him to pray in around the area, um, he's praying in his kitchen. And he was pouring his prayer into food that he was sending to the hospital for the frontline workers. And he was doing it um, because he was, his leadership is just driven by his values. And he doesn't know if he's going to be able to pay his rent. He doesn't know if he can bring back the employees he's had to furlough. But he's doing what he knows consistent with his values in a time where what else can you do? Uh, how else do you get out of bed? And I have to believe, as Dan mentioned earlier, that leaders who are, are working through their values that way will see benefits in the long run. All right, well, thank you so much to all three of our panelists. Um, for all of the questions, thank you for putting them in the chat. I hope I caught some of the the most salient points from the majority of them, but I apologize if I completely missed what you were hoping to get answered. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, and hopefully we will see you at the next SOM webinar. <laughs>